on this week, we are talking outside plant, the basics, which you need to know. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, technicians, project managers, estimators, ICT personnel, and everybody in the industry. We're trying to connect at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is produced? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms like Apple or Google or Stitcher, Would you mind leaving us a five-star rating? Those couple little steps helps us take on the algorithm, which helps us get the message out so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of the people in the ICT industry. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? I do a live stream on TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, everywhere, where you get to ask your favorite RCDD your questions about design, installation, certification, project management, even career path. But I can hear it with Chuck, I'm driving my truck at 6 p.m. on Thursday night. I don't want to get into an accident. That's okay. They are recorded. And you can watch them at letstalkcabling.com. And finally, while this show is free and will always remain free, if you find value in this content, click on the QR code right there where you can buy me a cup of tea. You can even schedule a 15-minute one-on-one Zoom call with me after hours, of course, and help support the show. As I mentioned, outside plant cabling, while it's not very difficult, there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about. A lot of low-voltage people spend the majority of their career inside of buildings doing inside plant cable, or ISP. There's an acronym for you. Most people don't know that one. They know the OSP, but they don't know the ISP. So from time to time, we do get asked to run cable between buildings. Sometimes we might have to coordinate with a service provider or an access provider to bring cabling into the building what if they want to bring it in 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 direct buried or underground well they sound similar they're different so i of course you know me i may not know everything in the ict industry i know a lot but not everything but i do know a lot of smart people so i reached out to a couple outside plant geniuses geniuses to come on the show today and let's welcome to the show Phil Klingsmith and Chad Schultesek. Chad and Phil, how you guys doing? Doing great. Doing okay. Doing okay. Did you I like that? Guys, I think Outside plant geniuses. Yeah, hey, I really appreciated that. I really did. I haven't been called a genius in a long time. And by the way, if I was a genius, that pool would really be mine out there. <laughs> <laughs> we know that that's just your virtual revit plan that you're going to have a pool there soon though okay we got you <laughs> so phil for the people who, in the audience who may not know you like i know because i've been around the industry while and i've i've known you forever tell give us the audience uh, the 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 brief who is phil clinging smith and why should we listen to him okay okay i can i can maybe convince you of a couple things uh, a lot of years ago, uh, I'll not name the number, I started with a little company called AT&T Long Lines. And AT&T Long Lines owned all the outside plant all over the world. They were the, they were the guru. We were, we were called AT&T, America's Traveling Tramps. And we did nothing but go around and put in outside plant everywhere. Did that for 19 years. 19 years was, I, I started out as a pole thumper. I'd go along and hit it with a sledgehammer at the bottom and see if it was safe to climb and work my way up to uh, a middle manager with AT&T before all things collapsed in uh, uh, 1984. But I've been, I've been around here. I've been around the industry for a lot of years. I was the only 35 year member, I think, that was in, uh, in the last conference at Bixie. So um, I'm happy to give you any of that information. And believe me, guys, there's a lot of that legacy stuff still out there that you need to know about. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because that's one of my, I don't want to say pet peeves, but, you know, I'm in a lot of social media groups, you know, uh, all over Facebook, Low Voltage Nation and 
and telecom community technicians and all that stuff. And when anybody ever posts a picture of a 66 block, all you ever hear is, oh, that's old legacy stuff. Everything's fiber now. I'm like, nee, no, there's still a lot of it out there. And if you don't know how to work it or service it, you will be left behind, period, right? Yeah. Chad, give us the, the 30 second. Who's Chad and why should we listen to Chad? I think sometimes uh, uh, I'm a brother from a different mother with Phil, just with the, some separation, because a lot of our uh, a lot of our background is pretty much similar uh, from being uh, in the service in the Navy, and uh, as well, I was at AT and T for uh, 18 years, and uh, a lot of my uh, a lot of my experience is OSP on the construction side of the house. Um, and also maintenance and uh, repair of all OSP cabling. Um, I worked in uh, all, all the plants, aerial, uh, drip buried, and underground. And uh, Very cool. Very cool. So we have a couple outside plant experts. <clears throat> okay, so who wants to answer the first question? Raise your hand. <laughs> see, I, don't, I can see where this show's going. <laughs> well, do, I, do I get my uh, own a friend? So what what is outside plants? What does that actually mean? What does it actually mean? It's well, you all know it's the stuff that's going to bring the service into the building or onto the campus or onto whatever type of location you're you're going to uh, have telecommunications inputted to so you can utilize it and get the networks and get outside. The uh, what really kind of set all this off was back in, in 1984, uh, January 1st of 1984, as a matter of fact, a little thing took place that was called divestiture. And divestiture said all at once, and it didn't tell a lot of people this in big, bold letters. It said all at once, hey, you own your outside plant, Mr. Customer. We're not going to fix it for you anymore. So it's all yours. And this is when we figured out that everything that a service provider brings into us from the outside world, from the central office or forever, wherever they're providing the service, everything that bring, they bring into us, they bring to a DMARC strip. And from that DMARC strip, every place it goes on that campus, on that commercial, on, in that commercial building or group of buildings, Every place it goes now belongs to us, the customer. So this is what we call outside plant. Anything that is going to continue that provision of service from the uh, provider outside, whoever they might be, to the inside that we can use to hook our network up. Excellent answer, Mr. Phil. Now I know why you are the, 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 the outside plant genius. Chad, I got a question for you. You're next. So Phil said that the cable that comes inside goes to a demarcation point, known as a demark, usually colored orange. Could be an orange cover, could be an orange backboard, could be lots of stuff. But not every outside plant cable that comes into the building is owned by a service or an access provider. Sometimes it's customer-owned outside plant. What's the difference between this, those two different types of outside plants? Well, actually, the physical cable may be the same because it's going to be outside. Um, really, you have to go to that D mark because uh, if anything that's going to the customer side, um, you can disconnect if you're troubleshooting. Say you're a technician, um, you can disconnect at that D mark, and let's just say you're putting tone on it, okay? So if you're putting tone and you know you're going in, and that in doesn't mean actually into a building. It could be going in and then back out. Mm -hmm. um, that should be a way to identify it just because your tone would not be going on the service provider side or the carrier side. It should be actually just going on your cable. Plus, there should be some sort of documentation as well. And I can tell you just from a job that myself and Phil were together on, sometimes that D mark isn't uh, actually inside of a building and it's not on an orange placard. 
It could actually ah. be in a, a vault somewhere where a carrier comes in and boom, it stops right there. Um, would that I be? Think that's would that be? Of, I, that'll be up to the customer. I think. Would that be considered minimum point of entry? Minimum point of presence yeah. might yes. be a good. Yes. Not yeah. It, it's not like the uh, info, but yes, it's it's actually a minimum point of entry that actually goes into that customer's property and it stops right there. Gotcha, gotcha. Because you hear that quite quite often. Minimum point of entry, minimum point of presence. Those are always two terms that kind of confuse people, right? Yeah, and, 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 yeah. And, and Phil already answered the question, what is divestiture and why it's important? So I'm going to test Phil's knowledge. You ready, yeah. Phil? Sure, go ahead. Who was the presiding judge? Oh, come on. <laughs> judge Green. Yes! What do you yes. mean? Judge Green, Green, by the way, yeah. Green, by the way, I just come wanted on. to tell you something. Green is the protected side of the DMARC. In case you ever see green as well as orange, you'll have your protection in between. So I remember Judge Green very well. Yeah. Judge Harold Green, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. so let's the cable can come into the to the property or to the building a couple of different ways, right? Um, aerial, direct buried underground. Um, and what am I missing? Aerial, direct buried and underground. Yeah, those are main three. So, Phil, why don't you tell us what exactly is aerial cabling? Oh, yes, aerial. My specialty, my first job with AT&T was dismantling a, a uh, network for uh, that, that was uh, open wire lines. And uh, this was an aerial cable that ran from um, actually from Cleveland, Ohio to um, uh, down into Charleston, West Virginia. And what it was was we actually had you actually had individual pairs of wire on this that that was run uh, on the on the telephone on the telephone lines the telephone poles that you see or still see in some cases with cross arms on them. So an aerial cable now can be an aerial cable that is a coaxial cable. It could be an aerial cable that's a that's a, uh, a a copper pair cable, or more likely, it's going to be a fiber optic cable, because we're putting so much of the fiber optics mm -hmm. up. But don't believe me. Don't say that you're never. Don't never say never, because you will you will run into you will run into a situation where someone has got an aerial interface coming into their building. And their aerial interface just happens to be a 900 pair cable, or a, it happens to be it happens to be in more cases now than than unless we run in a 25 pair cable is about all the copper we run into some of the buildings. But the aerial is up in the air. It's on a pole. It's or it can be attached to a building. It can be attached to any other types of of. Uh, of device that's going to hold it up there, but it one thing it shares in common: it's above the ground, it's up in the air, it's easier to maintain, it's easier to see, and it's cheaper to install. Yeah, because I mean, it's super easy to maintain because if you're doing a an audit on the cable plant, all you got to do is just drive down the road and look up at it. Right? It's not like direct barrier to burial cable where you don't really see if there's something's been damaging to it right so so chad tell us the well tell us what is direct buried and what is underground cable and how they are different well direct buried is basically what it is it's directly in contact with the earth it's just it's just a trench and it's it's buried uh obviously underground you think that would be the same but underground actually has a network of a conduit path or duct path that uh is uh used to get from cable from the maintenance hole to maintenance hole or a handhole or vault. And obviously the direct buried is going to be a little bit cheaper uh, to actually do at the, the, you know, at the point of uh, the beginning of it. And uh, cause it's very expensive to do a uh, uh, underground uh, platform. However, uh, let's just say there's a, what they call a legal mandate. So the, the government is going to change the road or do a uh, bypass or something like that. Uh, legal mandates, uh, if you get a uh, direct buried, it's basically that cable's done. You, you, you're just going to.
go a different route, you're losing all that cable right there. That's a lot more money that you're spending. If you have a maintenance hole or underground system, you'd be able to extend that. And if it's aerial, you'll still be able to use it. You just have to go out a different route. You may even be able to reuse that cable or whatever for something else, but the direct buried is just lost. Uh, yeah. So I guess really it comes down to direct buried cable is directly contacted earth and underground is in a um, um, conduit uh, duct path um, maintenance hole system. So you kind of already touched a little bit on pricing. So let's, Phil, we'll go back to you on this one. So give us a cost analysis of aerial, direct buried, and underground. Which is cheaper? Which is the most expensive? You know, the whole, okay. the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, and it, it, if you look at it, it, um, it, it seems, it, it seems um, when you look at aerial cable and people talk about aerial cable, they don't realize that aerial cable is probably the most economic of the bunch to put up. The cable is more reasonable in price. The actual the actual uh, infrastructure that's going to hold it is more reasonable and easier to access. Okay, so it's it's the but it is it does have some problems. It's it's ugly. Okay, let's place it. Uh, you know we got to face that it is ugly. If we look at if we look at a direct buried, direct buried is as Chad said, it's simple to put in the ground. You can dig a hole and drop it in, and that's pretty easy. All you have to do is cover it back up. But the problem is the cable is the most expensive of the three. And so when you look at the cable, you're, you're saying, gee, if I have to relocate this, I'm going to probably not going to be able to save the cable or any of the cable, and it's going to cost me a whole new installation. Where underground is the most expensive, the cable's cheaper, but it's the most expensive because the cable is protected by the conduit bank and everything else. But in the long run, underground is going to be your most cost effective, most cost effective from the standpoint of you're going to be able to change, you're going to be able to add, you're going to be able to move, you're going to be able to do the, all those things that we do for a living. You're going to be able to do those with that underground cable. What makes underground cable more expensive than the other two? Uh, the underground cable that is, uh, if you, if you talk, I'm not direct, I'm direct, direct buried, buried is what you, buried. yeah, direct okay. buried is what you meant. And direct buried, we got to protect from little critters like gophers, and uh, we've got to put something around it. The cable has got is usually an armored cable. If it's going to be a a uh, something high density that's going to be used in a priority type situation, so it's going to be a specialized cable that will withstand the big yellow fiber finders and things like that to go out there and go after you know the ones that have international harvester and John Deere is a green one I guess, but it's it's just the the makeup makeup of the cable itself. It causes it to be more expensive. In Actually, the, my, in the my dad area. might take offense. My dad might take offense to that because he's an <laughs> Oliver guy, which is a green. <laughs> okay. As well. and, All right. We'll go I, with that. I, I won't yeah. mention I got one of them green machines out in my barn outside there you too. Go. I'll, there you go. I'll leave that one out there, just right by there. Yeah. Um, aerial cabling. I would have expected that to be the most expensive. Um, I, I learned something new today because I've never, you know, like I said, I haven't done a whole bunch of outside plant, but. I would expect an aerial to be the most expensive because, you know, sometimes you have the messenger strand. Sometimes you got to worry about, you know, hurricanes, you know, icing. Yeah. So I, I would have expected aerial to be more expensive than the direct buried. Over the over the long term, over yeah. the long term, it, the cable itself. When you go out and purchase the cable itself, uh, I'll tell you a story. I was I was teaching a class on outside plant in in Bermuda one time. And uh, this was for Bixie when I was a master instructor for them. And what we uh, what we were talking about was we were talking about the the cost of the cable and everything. And I said that uh, you know that uh, old you know old outside plant cable uh, that uh, and the guy held his hand up right away and he said, Mr. Phil, uh, but let me let me stop you for a minute. We don't have any old outside plant aerial cable. 
every three <laughs> years a hurricane comes along and we replace the whole thing. But it's still replace it's it's still easier to replace it than it is to replace something from an earthquake or something that's that's direct buried in in a um, uh, or underground in an area where we've got very low where we've got very low water level, you know, the, 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 the water table, and we have to come up with a, almost a sub, submarine type cable. So it is, it, it doesn't seem like it, but in reality, your aerial plant is, is, is so much easier to maintain. You pop a bucket truck up and you can do what you want with it. It's not like you have to climb the pole anymore. And if you need to, if you need to make any moves, ads, or changes, it's easier to do. If you need to have fiber splicing, it's easier done uh, in a, in that the the same scenario. So generally, it's just a uh, it's a more reasonable it's a more reasonable cable to buy, and it's easier to protect. You don't have many gophers that are up there in the uh, uh, in the aerial cable. Squirrels, yeah. but maybe not. Well, I was going to say, I got all kinds of squirrels all over my property. <laughs> yeah, yeah, squirrels, but they don't like to get. Yeah. Um, I heard once, and maybe you can confirm this or not confirm this, or or maybe say you never heard of it. Someone told me once that they put almond extract in the jacket of the outside plant cable to help deter rodents. Yeah, but, you know, we found out that it was a lot easier than spreading almond extract just, you know, if we're going to run something in a direct buried scenario, all right, let's just let's just put it in in some kind of cheap, some kind of cheap conduit or inner duct that that the gopher can't get his mouth around. Right. OK. And so, yeah, there's uh, there's all kinds of stories. And that's a, <laughs> that's that's history for another day. There's all kinds of stories that we ran into having to reload, relocate cable paths because there were uh, um, uh, some kind of spotted owl or something that was up in a tree <laughs> and, or there was gophers that ran through this uh, this particular field and we had to relocate it because of the the gophers of the prairie dogs uh, I could I could tell you some serious stories there that you'd never believe so I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you one thing. There's nothing that's going to keep anything from getting into it. True. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 yeah, I haven't seen anything like that at, that would repel anything. Uh, I've watched my German shepherd run across the yard with an axe in her mouth. Okay. So <laughs> anything's possible. Yeah. Anything is possible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, water intrusion is a huge problem. Right. Mm. And a lot yeah. of the outside plant cables used to use this gel called Icky Pick. A lot of manufacturers are kind of moving away from Icky Pick using dry blocking agents and stuff like that. Do you do you think that Icky Pick is going to be around forever or will it eventually be replaced? Well, I think it's going, me, I think it's going to be around for a while, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think it's going to be there for and, and to be honest with you, nothing. Nothing is going to prevent water from getting into a splice that is buried. It will not stop it. Eventually, it will get in, and you will have to replace it. It's going to get into the cable. It's going to be replaced at some point. So, <laughs> it, as well said, I, I don't think uh, Icky Pick. You know, you're still going to you're still going to be able to tell the splicer when he comes in and he smells like citrus fruit um, <laughs> because. Yeah. He's, been, he's been trying to clean up Icky Pick, uh, but no, the uh, you're you're going to see you're going to see a lot of situations where if you were salvaging some copper cable, for example, on a uh, on a uh, on a campus, if you've got people in there that uh, uh, are going to try to save that cable, uh, they may try to they may try to uh, dry it out. It's probably got Icky Pick in it. Uh, and they're going to have to connect it with a, a current type of cabling, which there's all kinds of blocking that you can do. And there are scenarios that allow you to go from an icky pick cable to a uh, to a uh, some other type of of uh, water uh, intrusion uh, that's it's going to save it. There's there's all kinds of good. The manufacturers now have come up with some great some great cable. As far as as far as the water intrusion capabilities on it, 
Yeah, I, I had to laugh when you mentioned the uh, they smell like oranges. Um, orange extract, it's good for cleaning. It's a re- it's a really good cleaning yeah. solvent. Yeah. It's also good for killing ants. Oh, really? Yes, yeah. I, I I use it on the farm all the time. I mix <laughs> I mix uh, one cup of uh, orange extract with a gallon of water and a tiny bit of dish soap. It dissolves our exoskeleton. Boom, kills them, gone. So I, I know, you live in Florida, I ants are a that. problem. Right. You see that? Yeah, they've got, got fire ants down here. Oh, they, they are they, a problem. So yeah, uh, yeah and, and you spray some of that on it, and uh, it'll kill the initial mass. And then you got you got to spray it like two two to three more days because you know there's ants down in the mound, and uh, and then it, it ends up killing. I had some ants on my feet just yesterday, and I sprayed the outside of the container, gone, gone. And uh, and it's a lot cheaper than going out buying some harsh chemical to kill stuff. But it actually kind of leads me leads me to my next question: PPE, right? Yeah. Personal protective yeah. equipment. What are some PPE considerations that a that an installer should really consider when he's doing any type of the three types <clears throat> of outside plant cable? Chad, you ought to take that. You were just uh, through the OSHA thirty class. Uh, that, was, yeah, that, was that was a wild. That was a wild. He threw you um, under the bus there, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got no, it. It's, it's, it's actually been a couple of years since I did that. But uh, um, from being a technician, um, you can't take uh, working in OSP lightly, and you can't take in any environment that you work in. But with OSP, uh, there's some inherent dangers that. Uh, um, that go with it. Uh, obviously, when you're working in the underground, you're going to have to have uh, the proper uh, testing equipment to test for air, checking for gas. You know, you got to, I don't know, uh, a lot of people, they, they it's called a bailing. Basically, you got to dip it down into the, the water to check for, so you're not pumping out the, the water that's in the maintenance hole that could be, you know, have oil or gas in right. it or even the a sewer from someone's house may be leaking in there. Who knows? You don't want to go down there. Um, proper ventilation, uh, proper signage. Um, um, <laughs> I've had a tractor trailer drive over our maintenance hole and took everything out. Not that the signage helped, but those are things you had to you had to look out for. Um, and of course, with signage, you know, depending on the speed of the road, is how you have to place your placards and your signs um obviously wearing a hard hat uh i was gonna say probably your normal ppe right steel toe boots yeah hard hat I, I gloves one thing i know isp guys do not uh really i wouldn't say care or or i just don't think they use is what we call a fvd which is a uh, foreign voltage detector. So basically anytime, um, because if they're, say, say you have a storm, you, I don't know what's going on, you know, a couple blocks down the road. I, am, I may have power that came over onto, uh, over onto my strand. So anytime you go up, you got to check for foreign voltage to verify that you don't have anything happening. And again, you got uh, people stealing copper at the, right. You, you see the uh, the ground's coming down from the multi-neutral, and they just cut it. Uh, so you got to put up a – if you're working in that area, you got to put up a temporary bond. Um, there's a lot of things. A 188A, uh, a lot of like down there in Tampa or anywhere that still uses DC for the, the trains that go through or the trolleys, um, that uses uh, – will detect DC voltage. Um Yeah, and then cut gloves, your eyeglasses, yeah, your normal PPE stuff. But yeah. with OSP, you have to. There's a little bit more things you have to worry about. Digging a hole, you got to make sure you're sure and slope. Because if it's uh, over a certain footage, it, it can collapse on you, and you'll be dead. Right. Yeah. Um, so confined spaces has a whole bunch of. I need to do a show on confined spaces. Yeah. Um, I really reached did. out. Yeah. I, I, I reached out to. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who actually teaches safety classes, the OSHA 10 to OSHA 30. And he said he'd do it, but then he had some issues going on with his family life. And it, But I need to do that because it's extremely important because there's been a lot of documented cases where somebody would go into a maintenance hole, not a manhole, a maintenance hole. <laughs> yeah. 
and be overcome did, with did gas. Did I say name actually, earlier? Too low. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Did I say, okay. No, no, no. no, no. I, I, okay. I was pointing that out. I was pointing that out. And they become incapacitated because of low oxygen levels because there was something else that was down there. And somebody just, you know, not thinking, hey, I got to go help them. They jump in. Well, now they just became part yeah. of the problem yeah. instead of, you know. That's why they have those whole procedures, you know, for notified, know where the local, you know, local um, hospital is and, and and have the tripods on site and har- everybody's got to wear a harness. Even if you don't think nothing's going to happen, something can always yeah. happen. So. Yeah, and you always need Definitely. to have you always need to have somebody up your spot and you always need to have somebody as far as the, as far as as taking people don't think they say I take gas measurements. I use a sniffer when I go in the, when I go in the maintenance hole. But do you use a sniffer at three different levels in the maintenance hole? Do you use a sniffer so you can find out because all gases are not created equal? Some sink quicker, some are yeah. higher. So there's all kinds of things, and, and a lot of this, a lot of this information is covered in in CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, 29. Uh, you'll see a lot of it in there. It's something that you can you can dig out pretty easy. But this is what OSHA. It, confined space entry is is that's a that's a that's a spot in itself for your show. That, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's a show in itself. Exactly right. Yeah. So let's let's shift gears and let's talk about from a from an estimator's perspective or someone who's doing the design, right? What are some general design guidelines for Phil? Since you said you're the aerial expert, I'll let you start off with the aerial. <laughs> Okay, I'll start off with area. Well, you've got to look at what kind of what kind of ground do you have that you're going to plant poles in. Uh, that's going to be one of the one of the most significant things. You're going to look at your pole route. Obviously, your pole route's got to be it's got to be in an area where you're where you're you're laying it in properly or or deciding on it properly so that the levels the height of the poles they're not all the same. They need to be calculated. You need to, to get them at a certain level equally down from the ground down the road. You've got to be able to, if you plant a pole, you can't plant a pole in a, in a swamp. I mean, a pole is going to pull down. You've got to have, there, there are, these are where the old school items still come into play. And you can, you can use a, uh, uh, you can use a, a certain mounting technique that we can go over and, and it, it's called it's called a crib and you actually it's a box of rocks and you actually plant the pole in a box of rocks and a in, in, a, in a hole to maintain its stability uh there are there are various things that you've got to come up with as far as not only the size of the pole in height but the size of the pole and how it's capable of carrying what you're going to put on it not nearly as important as it was in my day climbing poles because we had my first cable I worked on was two 1200 pair lead sheath copper cables with quote the the actual the actual insulation on them was pulp paper and it was it was air core it had it had uh, air air dryers on it at various stations, so you can imagine what that weighed a foot. So you're not going to put that up there on a on a pole that's a that's a size ten pole. We used to call those a toothpick. You're going to put that up there on probably a five, which and and it's you need to know what these classes of poles are. All that information is available to you which I'm sure we'll talk about later. It's coming up. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's coming up later. <laughs> um, so quick, a question for you, Mr. Aerial expert, are all telephone poles the exact same distances apart or do they vary? And if they do vary, why do they vary? Yeah, they've got to vary because of the terrain number one. Okay. Uh, if you look at it, if you're putting a pole, if you're putting a pole uh, on a hill, yeah, you, uh, it, you, it's the next one in a valley. If you're running a pole down the down the street in a in a in a uh, an area, say a, a, a you know a main a main type of thoroughfare, um, you wouldn't be doing that too often anymore. But if you were, blocks are different sizes, and you can't put a pole in the middle of an alley. You can't put a pole in the middle of a street. You can't put a pole in in somebody's right of way. Okay, so you have to take that into consideration 
when you decide where you're going to plant the poles and how you design that. Will you tell that to my electric company? Because they put one of their poles right in the middle of my front yard. <laughs> I, I know. Feeding, feeding somebody else's house, not even feeding my house. Yeah. yeah. If it had my wow. house, I wouldn't have had an wow. issue with it, but it's feeding my neighbor's house. Right. <laughs> Chad, what are some uh, from things from an estimator's perspective when it comes to Dreg Buried and Underground? Uh, it, well, it's going to come down to what you're actually trying to bury in. I know like out in Texas, uh, a lot of their stuff is aerial just because it's uh, it's going to be too hard to dig and trench it. Um, I hear the same thing about Hawaii, too. Yeah, Ooh. probably all lava. It's all rock. And then you got your easements. Um, you can't just trespass on the someone's property so you're can, going to have to know what the easements are for can you, you're just, at. can you expand on because phil said right away and you all and you said <clears throat> easement. can you expand on those a little bit for those who may not know what those are the utilities uh i guess area where they're allowed to go like if let's just say uh you're in a backyard and uh, a lot of people get confused if there's an alley back there and they just think well that alley is there it's the city so i can put stuff there but normal subdivisions they have an easement right in their backyard and it's usually right on the 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 separation between this person's house and this person out and that there's an easement that, that gives the public utilities to be able to run their service through so the That's public the utilities way. actually owns that land ha huh. I wouldn't say they own that land. Did I open up a they, can of they worms? Have to, but they have the right to actually place that gotcha. there is what gotcha. it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There, is that, is, there, can, there can be ownership on that land. I mean, there can be. A, yeah, especially if you, you know, want to put a, a like a, a cell tower or a, a slick cabinet or a. And that's so one that, of the things that I always say is a, is a differentiation. When you look at a when you look at a right of way. You can still utilize the space that's in a right of way. I mean, if that's in my backyard, I've got in my backyard that, that where I was in Thornville up in Ohio, I had a, a 15 foot right of way, okay, that they had running down through there. And I had a barn, a little barn shed type sitting on top of that. That's perfectly legal. It wasn't, it was not a permanent structure. And as long as it's not a permanent structure, then uh, I can grow grass there. Uh, I can put whatever I want there. Uh, kids play, you know, uh, the play gym or whatever. Those things are. But when you go in and you're going to go into a, you're going to go into a constant area like up to radio towers. I, I used to buy. I used to buy these going these ex, these entrances and exits for radio towers. And what you did is you bought a strip of land through someone's property that only you were allowed to determine what was on it. And there's uh, all of those, all of those are kept. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was an operations manager, the e all of the, all of the uh, rights of way or easements that they purchased were kept in Bluffton, Ohio for AT&T and they were all on, uh, they were all kept on, on various types of microfiche and things like that at that point in time. So nobody knows what microfiche is. You know, <laughs> you can look at, you could go down there and look at them and I pulled some of them out before and they'd have, they'd have, you know, they'd have somebody like Alexander Graham Bell that signed it. So you knew that was a pretty old one. You know, but uh, these these things you've got to be careful of what you've got. If you've got right away, you've got public right away. You've got right away that you can request permits to get on. Okay. If you've got if you've got an easement, you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to spend some money. So, so, so Chad, let me follow, do the follow up question with you since you were talking about the direct buried underground. A lot of times when you bring in, you know, I, I did a project once in uh, Clinton, Mississippi. For uh, MCI Worldcom, they had a, I don't know, ten acre campus or something like that, two or three buildings on there. They had a lot of trees on that property, so if, if they if they bring in underground cable into that 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 building, going through all those the forest, what kind of design considerations, separation distances, should they think about for as far as keeping the roots from getting into the underground uh, the, the the underground? I don't think you can actually prevent that. There's something's going to happen. 
uh, in the underground, it, there's no real way of preventing something that's going to happen in the future. I, I, Phil, you might have a better one than this one. I, I, I wouldn't think, uh, number one, if I'm going through the woods, I don't think I'm really going through the woods unless I know there's going to, I'm going to follow maybe a path as far as where they're going to have a road that goes into the campus. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to, hey, I'm going to go through the woods because it's a shorter distance. Uh, if I'm going through the woods, I'm probably just going to clear a path and do aerial, to be honest with you. Um, I'm going to follow an already path that's uh, being used for the other public utilities that are going to go there. I'm going to use that same uh, pathway to go. Most got of those right of ways, most of those right of ways that they pick up and they've got like that out in it. If say I was looking at a new one, the right of way that was on the property would have um, stipulation that you could maintain the level of weeds and trees and things like this underneath the, the right or in the right of way. So you could actually you could actually provide maintenance to that that's part of the agreement that they have and um, you can as a homeowner or as a, a, a property owner you can ask for and be permitted to say no you can't you can't spray that i don't want you to spray it with some toxic chemical i want you to cut it so you can stipulate how they maintain that right away that runs through your property uh and in, in there are, there are a number of different, when you, when you buy easements, you've got more, more control over it. Uh, if you buy it. Okay. If you buy that, that piece of property through there, but, um, it's still, it's still gonna, it's still gonna wind up costing money. Uh, it's money's going to change hands. We had easements that went into, uh, uh, maintenance holes. Uh, I had, I had 350, miles of coaxial cable that I maintain and as an operations manager and they had they had the, the capability or we had the capability we bought this capability that we could go to our maintenance hole anytime we needed to go to our maintenance hole and we went through the the, the field it was in this was in western Ohio we would go through the field where our maintenance hole was. When we got to the maintenance hole, naturally we'd knock down a lot of crop. Well, you can imagine in, in, the, in the stipulation that we had to buy that piece of property to get in there, we had what was called a crop damage in that. And what they said was automatically that field became the highest producing soybean field yeah. in 75 <laughs> counties. But it, neither that's neither here nor there. The idea was you have to, you stipulate all these things by contract to get into this. So whether, whether it's just an easement, whether it's right away, public or private, you've got to have all of those details laid out. And there's many, many companies out there that do outside plant work have right-of-way agents that work for them because a right-of-way agent is a very valuable is a very valuable commodity when it comes to laying out one of these contracts oh and i guarantee you there's lawyers involved in it too on both oh, sides oh yes oh yes oh, yeah. you follow the money <laughs> exactly so let me ask this whoever wants to answer this question can take this one there's a lot of people who don't know how to do outside plant where can where can someone find some more detailed or learn more about outside plant yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, you get the uh, OSP certification through Bixi that will uh, help you. Uh, that's uh, something that you already have, Phil, and something that I'm still working on. Um, but there's also a lot as far as a technician that I think um, having somebody... Uh, that's been doing this for a while, I guess a mentor or um, there's even some classes or schools out there. So, you know, because, you know, say I want to be a splicer. You might have to uh, actually go to a class that is just for uh, splicing instead of going for a certain um, uh, certification, maybe from Bixi, because like the fiber class in there, you're learning a broad uh, spectrum for fiber. Uh, for the fiber uh, IN250, but with 
hey, I wanna, I wanna do a uh, uh, <laughs> cat. That's your cat. Uh, cats are allowed. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, I think, uh, it, say, I want to learn how to do ribbon splicing, right? I, I'm not going to get that at, in the IN250. I'm just not. I'm not going to learn how to de sheath a big cable and fricate it and um, how to build a splice case for it. The same with copper, or even with copper. If I, you know, you're, there's not a whole bunch of copper splicing. And to be honest with you, I remember when I was a copper splicer, the guys who were making the money were the fiber splicers because there was more copper splicers than fiber splicers. Well, right. that has changed. That cat will sit right here if I don't change it. <laughs> it will sit right there. <laughs> but nowadays, there's more fiber splicers than there are copper splicers. Copper splicers. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. You know, it's kind of changed around, and there's still a lot of copper work out there. Again, with the IN225, you learn a lot about the copper media, but if I want to be an OSP copper splicer, you're going to have to go to, there's got to be a program out there um, right. Right. where it's going to teach you that. And again, it's going to teach you how to climb, how to gaff a pole, how to work in those I was going to say, there's pole climbing classes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, how to work uh, uh, in pedestals and the, and the underground, you know. A lot of that's going to come working on that, uh, like a telecom side. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I would call storm chasers, right? Yes. So, so you got the guys who go out to a storm and they make a lot of, a lot of good money. Uh, they go out there and they hang cables, splice it, um, and to get that training, sometimes maybe you go work for that guy and they kind of give you OJT. But there's also classes out there um, that will teach you how to splice. So it sounds like there's lots of resources. You did mention yeah. the uh, the OSP manual. Um, I, I believe they got a new one coming out, don't they? They're just they're just starting on it. Uh, yeah. We, uh, yeah, yeah. We've. Uh, I think Chad's going to probably be one of the the people that helps to work on it. I well, he should be I able am. to pass the OSP exam pretty easy if he's helping write the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's always that's always a joke. That's always a joke. But in it, in answer to your question, as you first asked, where do you go to get the information? The information is the the source of the information is highlighted in in the Bixie programs. And as Chad says, there's going to be independent classes that you're going to have to take when you come up with specifics, like if you're you know, we're working on fiber cables now that are that are uh, 34, 56 and beyond. I mean, 3,000, oh, yeah. 3,456 strands of fiber that oh. you're going to have to go out there and 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 you you can hang it or you can run it through you can run it through fiber mesh type of or fabric uh, type of of interduct. You can run it through conduits. You can run it through anything you want. You need to find out the detail of how to do that. And a lot of that detail rests with the uh, with Bixie. And I'll I'll give what Bixie doesn't have in their classes. Like Chad said, they're going to direct you to other classes right. that are going to give you the the, the significant uh, the things that you need to know on it. So it's uh, yeah, it's 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 alive and well. Uh, outside plant cable, outside plant in the outside plant environment, uh, it's not something you want to just write off and say, hey, that's the old guy talking. It's right. not the old guy talking. Right. It's the old guy telling you, you need to know this young guy if you want to be successful and become an old guy in the industry. Absolutely. You know, I saw a video just the other day where somebody was drilling, I think for like a fence post or something, and they hit a rainbow root, <laughs> a rainbow root. <laughs> for those of me not know what that is, it's a, it was a, it was a multi-pair cable, copper cable. I don't know, it looked yeah. like it was like a 400 pair, 600 pair, something like that. Can you imagine if they drill through a 3456 fiber? Oh, yeah. Oh, I just, oh that's going to be expensive. That's it's gonna just, be. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, got a story about that. I was doing a, I was doing a class in Yuma, Arizona for, for the, uh, for the, for the Marine Corps. And I went through the color code on, uh, and I, I had, I had a 2400 pair of cable that I was talking to him about the color code and how you could, how you could splice, you'd know each individual pair count in that, in that color code. 
And a guy came up to me, the sergeant major, he says, we're never going to need to use this. You're boring and you're wasting my people's time. And I said, okay, I'll cut it out of the class. A few minutes later, a guy came walking in the room and whispered something in the gunny's ear, the gunny sergeant's ear. All at once, the guy said, Mr. Klingensmith, the year before he'd been just calling me Phil. He said, Mr. Klingensmith, uh, we have a problem. We just had a we just had a contractor that used an auger to plant a fence post and went through a 2400 pair cable. Do you think you might be able to help us separate this? I thought, I thought you didn't need it, Gunny. <laughs> you know, but it, you got to remember this stuff. I'm not trying to. Well, it's been it's been it's been a career for me. I guess I can say that. I'm not trying to say that that's the only reason you need it. You need it for your career, not my career. Right. Okay. Right. Gentlemen, I appreciate both of you coming on today. Wealth of information. I think we only scratched the surface. Oh, I mean, there's a, so there's a ton more information. Here, here's some old uh, old manuals. Can you buy old, those? Uh, can, you, can you buy those on the internet by any chance? I, I no, think you no, should. No, I, I can you get from, any of them anymore? I got these from uh, out of my uh, work truck back in the day. There you yeah. go. There's a lot of that stuff still out there and a lot of good people that know about it. And so uh, use them. I appreciate you guys, you guys coming on today. And I, and depending if we get on questions, you guys willing to come back on and do a, a follow-up if we get a whole bunch of questions? Absolutely. Nice. Nice. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen. I appreciate having you guys today. Hey, thanks a lot. Appreciate the opportunity. Do it again anytime. All right. Take care, guys. Thank Bye. You. So hopefully – you learned that outside plant is going to be around for a long time. You might want to learn how to do it. It could be more money for you as a technician, more money for you, even if you're a company. Till next time, knowledge is power.